The U.S. goes to the polls and the world is watching. Millions of Americans are voting for the next president. So how is the election being viewed by other countries? This is Inside Story. Hello, I'm Imran Khan. After one of the most divisive campaigns in years, Americans finally have their say on who should be their next president. Millions are choosing to either give Donald Trump another four years or put Joe Biden in the White House. But no matter who wins on Tuesday, the news will reverberate across the globe. It's often said that the US president is the most powerful person in the world. So in this special episode of Inside Sport Story, uh, we'll speak to Al Jazeera's correspondents in China, Russia, the UK, Iraq, Iran and Israel to see how those countries and their regions are viewing the US election. Donald Trump has had a tense relationship with China. A trade war led to both countries imposing billions of dollars in tariff. Washington has criticized Beijing's national security law in Hong Kong, human rights violations and territorial claims in the South China Sea. But it's the pandemic which emerged from the Chinese city of Wuhan late last year that has come to shape the U.S. presidential campaign. Because of our relentless efforts, the recovery rate right now on COVID or the China virus or the China plague is 99.7 percent. Take the word. 99.7 percent. And I'm here. I'm here. I'm... He waved the white flag of surrender. I'll never surrender. We're going to beat this virus. We're going to get it under control. And the first step, the first step to beating this virus is beating Donald Trump. First of our correspondents, up is Katrina Yu in Shanghai. Katrina, this has been one of the most complicated, perhaps the most complicated relationships that Donald Trump has with a foreign power. Massive Chinese investment, yet there was this trade war and uh, criticism of its role in Hong Kong. What is China thinking when it comes down to the elections now? Is it that they might be better off with, uh, with Biden or is it better the devil you know? Well, in terms of the Trump administration, it's really a really tough time for the Chinese government these past four years. We saw the it started out well with uh, Trump really heaping praise on President Xi Jinping, but it quickly deteriorated in 2017 with the initiation of this trade war with tariffs that have really hurt Chinese manufacturers. And then we had these really restrictive technology restrictions imposed that have really harmed Chinese technology companies such as Huawei and really dealt a blow to China's uh, 5G global plans. And of course, we've also seen the Trump administration put a lot of pressure on China when it comes to issues that you mentioned, South China Sea, human rights violations. And because of this, we've really seen a freefall uh, in China's soft power and its standing in the world because of also the pandemic, of course. And this charge has really been led by the US under the Trump administration. But when it comes to this option between Biden and Trump, China is really caught between a rock and a hard place because both of these men have said they're going, they're going to continue a tough on China approach. And for Beijing, this frosty relationship between China and the US, they really don't see this ending anytime soon. Trump gets re-elected. China will try to build a consensus with Trump, really focusing perhaps on uh, continuing these trade conversations. But if Biden gets elected, we might see a change of style. He might return to a more conventional style of diplomacy. He might be less predict unpredictable. But really, he's also going to uh, continue to be hard on China. And he might even focus on issues that China uh, is really less willing to have conversations over, for, for example, social political issues and human rights. But isn't it the case that China is simply too big for any real damage to be done by either uh, Donald Trump or Joe Biden, that in fact, it is something that the Americans just have to deal with. Definitely, when it comes to China, what they've tried to do with this election is keep their heads down and really not comment too much on what the outcome might be. As I said, the way they see it going forward, the relationship between China and the US is not going to improve. The 
age of friendly engagement between these two countries, the way Beijing sees it, is over. And what they're going to try to do is really go ahead and become less reliant on the U.S. to the point that the Chinese Communist Party recently had their plenum planning mm. for the next 15 years for, the, uh, for China's direction. And really the main message there was mm. China has to become more self-reliant going forward, especially when it comes to technology and building up its economy. Uh, so when it comes to that, China's... Uh, its ambitions overall, dominating technology in the long term, uh, these are not going to change regardless of who wins the election in the US. Katrina Yu in Shanghai there, thank you very much. Now, just like the election four years ago, Russia is again denying accusations of interference in the campaign in favour of Donald Trump. The president has been accused of failing to stand up to Vladimir Putin and suspected Russian aggression. Democrat Joe Biden has called Russia the biggest threat to America's security. Let's bring in Alexandra Stoyanovich Godfroy in Moscow. Uh, welcome uh, to the show. Again, another complicated relationship between Donald Trump and the Russians. What's Moscow looking forward to? Is it looking forward to retooling this relationship or is it simply... We just have to deal with the cards we're given. Well, you see, uh, there is far less excitement about these elections than it was uh, four years ago here in Russia, and that is both on official level as amongst uh, the ordinary Russians. Uh, now, uh, four years ago, there was a hope, uh, which was showed in, in the polls of public opinion, that things, uh, relations between Russia and United States might get better. But these cr hopes were crushed very soon, and by the summer of 2017, even Vladimir Putin called his relations at the their all-time low. So this uh, time, uh, Russia is standing aside and they are not saying neither Trump nor Biden. They are saying that actually the politics towards Russia is not going to change whoever sits uh, in uh, the uh, Oval Office. What they are saying, and this also reflects in the polls, is that it doesn't matter what happens in United States, that if there is any bipartisan in United States, it is in this consensus of uh, being anti anti-Russian. Now, uh, these uh, things come because uh, during the Trump presidency, actually what Russia sees is that uh, Donald Trump and his administration didn't do anything uh, to make these relations better. He did impose sanctions. Uh, he also imposed sanctions on a very important project uh, for Russia, that is uh, this mm. uh, pipeline, uh, uh, Nord Stream 2. He also expelled the Russian uh, diplomats. So the hopes that this might get better, there are, uh, there are none. Uh, this time uh, compared to four years ago. But does Russia really have the luxury of standing aside? If Joe Biden wins the election, it's likely that Russian interference in the previous election will come back up. There will be investigations made. Uh, so it's likely that there will be criticism again, even from Joe Biden coming towards Russia. Uh, is that something the Russians are concerned about? Well, I wouldn't say so, because you see, uh, at the very end of his presidency, Obama already imposed sanctions for the interference uh, in, in, in these elections. We can expect that if uh, Biden wins, there will be new ones in uh, this respect. But what Russia can hope also from Biden is that, for instance, he does sign the continuing of a treaty, which is very prestigious for Russia, the treaty on a new START deal uh, of, about nuclear arms, the, the last one standing, that he might revisit the position about North stream too. So there are also some positive signs that can be expected from Joe Biden, who uh, does not hide his sentiments, uh, which are negative uh, towards uh, Russian politics. On the other hand, um, uh, as we could hear also in the case of China, uh, he might hit them hard also on human rights issue, on democracy. So uh, they, uh, Russia did not, uh, doesn't feel that they got something uh, from, from the presidency of Donald Trump that can get uh, things uh, uh, worse if uh, Joe Biden is elected uh, president. Alexandra, thank you very much. Now, let's get the view from America's traditional allies in Europe, where leaders are at odds with Donald Trump on issues including the Iran nuclear deal, NATO's defence budget and climate change. Nadim Barber is in London. Nadim, let's concentrate on London and the UK first. I mean, Boris Johnson um, is very much hoping that he, uh, that Donald Trump wins uh, this election because it'll mean Brexit might get saved. Joe Biden has already been very critical of Brexit because of the threat to, the, uh, to Ireland and the Good Friday Agreement. So is it as simple as that, though? Is it as simple as the, that Boris Johnson wants 
a Donald Trump victory? I don't think uh, you can say it is as simple as that, because Brexit, of course, is a very complicated issue, and so is the Good Friday peace agreement uh, on the island of Ireland. So, of course, it's, a, it's an open secret that Boris Johnson uh, is very, very keen, if not desperate, for some kind of free trade deal with the United States. Of course, the United States will come with its own conditions, which concern some of Boris Johnson's own supporters. But yes, that's top of his to-do list uh, next January, once uh, Britain is no longer uh, in the status quo that it is in terms of uh, its relationship with the European Union. Now, um, personality-wise, yes, Boris Johnson uh, has got on very well with uh, President Trump, even though he had some uh, harsh words for him a few years ago when he was London mayor. Uh, and, of course, Donald Trump has referred to his friend Boris Johnson, calling him Britain Trump. Interestingly, on the flip side, uh, Joe Biden has actually said that he sees um, uh, Bo um, Boris Johnson as, quote, the physical and emotional clone of Trump. That's an actual quote from uh, Joe Biden from the recent past. Of course, uh, diplomacy means that that will all be put to one side. Hard uh, bargaining will happen in any trade negotiations. But I think whoever is the next US president, it's clear that they won't be entering into a deal if, in fact, it's seen in the US to endanger the uh, security of uh, Northern Ireland and the Republic of Ireland and, in fact, the, uh, the um, frictionless trade on the island of Ireland. So, of course, yes, Trump was the man who backed Brexit. He even told former Prime Minister Theresa May to sue the European Union at one stage as a, a tactic, um, which was never going to happen. But behind that lies some very um, real um, concerns, real, real uh, conditions and real um, uh, barriers, perhaps, to, to any trade deal happening quickly. Well, let's talk about the uh, European Union, the EU. And often uh, the leaders of the EU are referred to as being Germany. Now, Germany has a fraught relationship with uh, Donald Trump. Uh, certainly Angela Merkel and Donald Trump, there's no love lost there uh, between them. Now, when it comes down to Europe, they'll be looking for a Biden presidency, surely? I mean, yes, basically behind the scenes, most leaders of European governments uh, uh, are looking for stability. The last four years have seen instability and a move away from multilateralism. And uh, uh, in many people's eyes, the denigration of the institutions set up after the Second World War, which create that multilateralism, including the NATO Defence Alliance. Now, President Trump has really gone on the attack uh, against many uh, NATO allies, but particularly singling out Germany, calling them delinquent for not, in his eyes, paying their dues. Uh, and he has threatened to withdraw to reduce the number of US troops in Germany. Uh, and the alliance is uh, basically hoping, yes, for a Biden win for that reason, for stability and a return to the kind of communal decision making and approach to security issues. In fact, next March, NATO is reported to be uh, planning uh, an early summit to welcome in President Biden if, in fact, Joe Biden does win the election. Nadine Barber there in London. Thank you very much. One of Donald Trump's biggest foreign policy decisions was to pull the US out of the Iran nuclear deal and reimpose tougher economic sanctions on Tehran. Joe Biden's offered to rejoin the 2015 agreement if Iran shows compliance. Ties with the US have deteriorated in neighboring Iraq as well, home to about 3,000 American soldiers. Now, let's bring in uh, Simona Foltin in Baghdad and Asad Beg in the Iranian capital of Tehran. I want to begin with you, Simona, first. It's one, it's a very complicated relationship, as all of Donald Trump's relationships with foreign powers seem to be. You've got a stage where he has backed the Iraqi government, but he doesn't seem to know what to do with Iraq. What are the Iraqis hoping for when it comes to this election? Well, the major concern for many Iraqis is uh, stability and sovereignty. We've seen uh, over the past year that 
Iraq uh, was on the cusp of yet another war as tensions rose between the United States uh, and Iran, with Iraq risking uh, to become the main battleground uh, for the two sides. We've seen an increase in the number of rocket attacks uh, targeting U.S. facilities, which were blamed on pro-Iranian groups. And we've also seen uh, the U.S. act unilaterally to counter those attacks by, for example, assassinating uh, Qasem Soleimani, uh, as well as Abu Mahdi al-Mohandis, the second in charge of the popular mobilization forces here in Iraq, which is uh, this Iranian-backed umbrella group of, of armed groups. So uh, there was a lot of opposition to that specific uh, decision, both from the side of parliament, which shortly after voted to expel U.S. troops from Iraq, but also from many Iraqis who simply saw this intervention uh, as a violation of, uh, of their sovereignty and who also feared that uh, Iraq could descend into another war just two years after it had come out uh, of a four-year war against, uh, against ISIL. So uh, that is, those are definitely the main concerns for Iraqis, but it's also to, uh, to help the country emerge out of uh, a long-lasting economic crisis that has only been made worse by the global decline in oil prices and also the pandemic. Many look towards the United States to, uh, to help the country recover, to help get access to financing on international markets and to open up more opportunities uh, for the youth. Th those things that you mentioned, particularly when it comes to the role of Iran, that's not going to really change if Joe Biden gets in. Is there concern from the Iraqi government that actually they'll just be replacing one U.S. leader with the same policies that another U.S. leader will have? Well, it's not clear what direction the Biden administration would take if Joe Biden indeed uh, wins. And many Iraqi officials, of course, want the strategic dialogue to continue, which started uh, earlier this year between the United States and Iraq. But Joe Biden himself has a rather fraught track record in Iraq. He voted uh, in favor of the Iraq invasion in 2003. Uh, he also, under uh, Obama's administration, in 2009, when he came into the office, he was charged with, uh, with withdrawing the 150,000 troops that were based here at that time. And of course, that uh, resulted in a security vacuum, which eventually enabled uh, the rise of ISIL. So if Biden were to win, uh, certainly many see uh, it as, uh, you know, he should be departing from uh, the Obama era policies to try to come up with a new approach towards Iraq. To Tehran and to our correspondent, Assad Baig. Assad, this is a very crucial election for the Iranians. In fact, speaking to Iranian officials and uh, experts, many of them on this show, the Iranian foreign policy towards the US seems to have been frozen. It's like, well, let's just wait till November to see what happens. Here we are in November. What are the Iranians hoping for? Well, very much it has been, let's wait and see, as the United States under Donald Trump has increased pressure on Iran with more sanctions uh, and going to the United Nations to try and reimpose those United Nations sanctions. Now, the Iranian position has been, uh, the Supreme Leader today speaking, Ayatollah Khamenei, said that Iran's policy will not change towards the US, uh, no matter who is elected. But actually, there are politicians amongst the political establishment here that are hoping that Biden will win. That's because they hope Biden will return to the 2015 nuclear deal, uh, lift some of those sanctions, allowing some relief for the economy and normal Iranians. But there are also some that want Donald Trump Trump to win. Now, you may ask, why, why is that? That's because many believe that Trump has isolated the United States in the international community and handed Iran a series of diplomatic victories at the United Nations, especially. But they think that if Biden wins, he will bring on board the Europeans, get the sympathy of the Russians and the Chinese, and ask for more concessions whilst trying to return to that deal. And that's something that Iran doesn't really want to do. So opinion is split, but generally when I'm speaking to people out on the streets uh, and the majority of politicians, in, at least from the reformist camp, uh, they're hoping that Biden will win and hopefully there will, will be some relief uh, for, for the Iranian economy and people. But there has been some criticism of the Iranians themselves that they didn't really understand Donald Trump, that actually all Donald Trump wanted to do was change the Joint Comprehensive Plan of Action to the Trump Comprehensive Plan of Action, in fact, just do a new deal, and that didn't happen. Is there a, is there a fear that actually it's too late for the Iran nuclear deal, uh, that actually it's just gone away now, even if Biden wins? 
Well, there's different camps, as I say. So the reformists are still holding on and hoping that they can salvage this deal. Uh, and the conservatives have said, look, we never trusted the United States. We knew that this would happen. We just went along with it because the reformists were in power. But the problem with the Trump plan, or at least a Trump deal, was that he wanted to bring on board, uh, bring into play Iran's ballistic missile program. And now that's been a red line for Iran, right. because as far as they're concerned, uh, Iran's missile program, Iran's defense, is central to Iran's defense. And one of the only reasons that Iran hasn't been attacked is because it's strong militarily. So Iran doesn't want to make any more concessions. That's what, at least what they're saying publicly. But there have been rumors uh, and certain reports outside the country that there have been secret talks taking place between the United States and Iran. Now, no one here is confirming that. In fact, uh, they deny it flat out. But that door, that door is always open. There's always a possibility of secret talks. But in, in, at, least, at least in the face of it, Iran is saying uh, we will not compromise. The red line is our defense. Uh, but they are hoping that the 2015 nuclear deal can be saved. I want to thank Simona in Baghdad, Assad in Tehran as well. Thank you both. Donald Trump has radically changed the U.S. role in the peace process between the Israelis and the Palestinians. His administration recognized Jerusalem as Israel's capital and moved the American embassy to the city. He unveiled a peace plan that's been widely criticized by Palestinian leaders and negotiated a normalization of ties between Israel and three Arab countries, urging others in the Middle East to follow suit. Now, Harry Fawcett is our correspondent in West Jerusalem. Harry, it's often been described that Donald Trump is the greatest friend Israel has ever had. So clearly, if you're Netanyahu right now, you are really hoping that Donald Trump comes to power again. But are there any dissenting voices to that opinion? Oh, well, there are some. But if, if you look at the polling of Israelis in terms of their support for Donald Trump, or at least their estimation of what a Trump continued Trump presidency would do for Israel, uh, I mean, it's very clear he would win uh, in a landslide if, if Israeli votes were the only ones that counted. There's definitely a recognition in that, I think, of the various gifts that Trump has bestowed on the state of Israel during the last four years. You mentioned the moving of the embassy, declaring uh, Jerusalem the capital of Israel, the Trump plan, and, of course, more recently, these deals that the United States has helped engineer with other Arab, with Arab states between Israel and, and Arab states in the region. And so you, you were here for some of those Groundhog Day elections over the last couple of years. You saw those enormous Trump Netanyahu posters, Netanyahu brandishing his relationship with Trump as really uh, evidence of his statesmanship and his wise leadership of the country. If Trump loses the presidency, of course, that causes a pretty big domestic problem for Netanyahu. He will have to both try to work with the Biden administration uh, while perhaps returning to his public, outward-facing and domestically-facing sort of opposition, showing that he's the one who can take on a less friendly US president. Well, let's bring in the Palestinians here. I was reading today an article that was quite interesting. It said that the Palestinians have simply uh, given up on the US being an honest broker in any kind of negotiations, no matter who's in power. Is that something that you may have heard? I certainly heard that uh, from the man who used to be the PLO representative to Washington, Hussam Zumlat. Uh, he was chucked out when the United States administration shut down that mission in 2018. And he said something very similar to me. He said, basically, I put it to him that, that surely a Biden administration would potentially reverse some of the excesses, as far as the Palestinians are concerned, of what Trump has done, and that that might represent a, a hope for, for change. He said, well, no, it's time to, to move on. We're not just sitting here on tenderhooks waiting for a new occupant of the White House. Uh, we are exploring other options. Uh, the United States has ceased to be what it used to be. Uh, there have been 30 years of, of attempting to change the status quo under US leadership. It hasn't worked, and so we're calling on other countries, this multilateral approach, to get involved. And that, of, of course, is the official policy of Mahmoud Abbas. Hasn't really got a huge amount of traction so far. And I think other voices within the Palestinian movement do recognize the sheer weight of power that the United States has. And perhaps more importantly, they realize what four more years of Trump could further do to the Palestinian cause. And so there are others who are very much waiting for uh, the, the prospect of a Biden presidency, even if it doesn't mean an immediate shift, even if he has many other things on his plate 
than trying to focus immediately on the Israel-Palestine issue. But if you look at what Nabil Shaf, an advisor to President Abbas, said a couple of days ago, uh, that it's the most important thing that Trump goes. Uh, the pa Palestinian Prime Minister, uh, Shteya, also saying, God help us, God help the world if he continues in office. So I think the, pri the priority really is that Trump is voted out rather than any huge expectation of major changes under Biden. Uh, thank you very much to Harry Fawcett in West Jerusalem. And thanks to all our correspondents for joining today's Inside Story. We'll have full coverage of the US election, the latest results and reactions on air and online at aljazeera.com. And for further discussion, go to our Facebook page. That's facebook.com forward slash AJ Inside Story. And you can also join the conversation on Twitter. We are at AJ Inside Story. From me, Imran Khan, and the entire team here in Doha, bye for now. Thank you.